Luke chapter number 6 this morning. So we kind of, we addressed this starting last week. Uh, while in Jerusalem, we uh, saw that Jesus was fa- having fierce opposition from the Pharisees and because he was, uh, his practices on the Sabbath, healing people on the Sabbath. And in order to prove that he was Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus healed a man in front of the Pharisees. And then he taught, it was taught to do, it was appropriate to do good deeds on the Sabbath, like we were talking about last week. And then following all of the Sabbath controversies, Jesus left Jerusalem after that feast period, and he journeyed back to Galilee. And it's in Galilee that we see that he calls the apostles to a life of ministry of following him. Now, this is a call for them to stop merely following and begin serving. Now, I think that's an important aspect. We have addressed that a couple of times. There is a big difference between a follower of Christ and a disciple of Christ. And Jesus has called all of these individuals to follow him, but now in this passage, we see that he is calling them for a life of service. Not not just following anymore, but a begin serving us that and, and and here's the truth is that we as believers every believer will be faced with the decision to just stop learning about jesus and start serving jesus now this is an important aspect because we do make an emphasis on discipleship we have our discipleship ministry we have our, our own curriculum for that we we care a lot about people knowing god's word but there will have to be a time where we said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to stop just being a follower or a learner and sitting in the pew. I'm going to go and serve him. There, there is a vast difference between a, a follower and a disciple. Or one who is just sitting to learn and then one who begins to serve. And we see Jesus is calling these apostles to go and serve him. And God has called every one of us to serve him as well. Now there are some distinctions between the apostles and, uh, and, and dis, uh, disciples of, and followers of Christ as today. And we're going to talk about some of those differences, but then also how that applies to us as well. So let's pray real quick, and then we'll hop into our text. Lord, I pray that you help us this morning as we open up your word to see the call of the disciples and see what that means for us and our call of following you and pursuing you in our life. Lord, I pray that you help us to be believers who are not just learners, but one who are servers as well. Lord, I pray that you help our church to be a a church that is filled with people who desire to serve the Lord, not just to sit and follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse number 12. We're we're not going to read a whole lot of passages this morning, but it says, And it came to pass in those days he went out into a mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, who also he named apostles, Simon, which was also named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of uh, Eliphas, Simon, called Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which is also the traitor. You know, in our passage today, we're looking at there. Are, he's listing off all the people who decided to he decided to call out in service. Now, like I said, there is a big difference between a follower of Christ and an apostle of Christ. There is a big difference between just a person who wants to learn about Christ and one who actually chooses to serve Christ. You know, up to this point, he's already asked them to follow him. And they've already left everything behind. We looked at that when he called Matthew out uh, to follow him from being a tax collector. But now he's asking them for a little bit more. He's saying, don't just follow me. It's time to serve. So in this, in this call to the apostles, there's a couple of things. First of all, we need to look at verse number 12. It, it says, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. So number one, we see the supplication of the Lord. Now, this is an important aspect of our Christian life because before he made, before Jesus himself made any decisions regarding to who was going to be his apostles, Jesus prayed to seek the will of the Father. And that's important for us to understand also because 
Jesus, uh, Jesus's authority was rooted in who he was, but also in prayer. That prayer, was, prayer had mattered. He, he leaves us an example in which we're meant to pray humbly before we serve boldly. Now, we, we have an emphasis on being bold for our stance for the Lord. That is our emphasis. Go out and stand for what's right and be bold. But before we can serve boldly, we have to pray humbly. And Jesus went out and he decided to pray all night before he called these apostles. John 8, 28 it says, and Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath sent me, I speak these things. So Jesus had spent plenty of time in humble prayer before the Lord, and one of the em emphasis for us is, as believers, when we spend time in supplication for the Lord, we have to realize, first of all, that was a special place. So it was a common practice for Jesus to isolate himself in a time of prayer, to go find a place where no one else was going to bother him. You know, in, in our lives, it's easy to allow things like social media, busy schedules to distract us from God. Uh, and it's essential for us to find time to spend time with him, especially before making a major decision. There are a lot of things that I spend uh, time in prayer and fasting about, in asking God's guidance, there's been many times where we were praying about our church, and I've asked our leadership to also uh, think about praying and fasting in the decisions that have to be made. And, but it has to be a special place. There was a, time, a place set apart for him to pray. And in this one, it was a mountain. Matthew 6, 46 is then he, was sent, he sent them away, and he departed into a mountain to pray. He said, like, you can go ahead and go away. I'm going to take some time by myself to spend time in prayer. Now, the important part is, is because he's not trying to find anything to distract him. And uh, anyone who has kids at home know that if you try to pray, then your kids are going to instantly decide to be hungry, and they're tired, and they want something to drink, and then they're going to distract you, and then you're trying to pray, and then they're, they're constantly coming up saying, Daddy, I need something, I need something, I need something. I'm tired, I'm hungry, can I have a snack? Whatever it is in the middle of prayer. Or it's like, what are you doing? And they want to talk. And, and then it's like, are you praying? I'm like, yes, I'm praying. It's like, okay, all right, well, I need this. I'm like, how about after I'm praying? It's like, no, are, are you praying? I'm like, yes, I already told you I'm praying. This is the routine of why we need to find a special place to go and pray. So it was a special place. Not only was this supplication with the Lord a special place, but there was a dedicated time to pray. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, And in the morning, rise up a great while before day. And he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. You know, there was not just a special place, but there was a, a dedicated time. Now, on this occasion, Jesus spent the entire night in prayer. That doesn't mean that, oh, every time you pray, you have to pray all night for major decisions. But by this time, he knew the opposition in his ministry. He knew that the Pharisees were against him. He knew that everything against him was growing, and he, he, he still had dedicated a specific times to pray. Now, we have the awesome privileges of coming before the Lord boldly, going before the Father in prayer boldly, just as Jesus had. God wants to hear from us. And it's sad that there are many people who are claimed to be believers who they go out, they read their Bible, they, they, uh, will, they'll attend church, they'll even serve, but they really don't spend adequate time in prayer. That's why, you know, we have a prayer ministry here at, at Mountain View. We have every single day, there's someone praying for the prayer request given to our church an hour every single day. Why? Because we want to make an emphasis on prayer. You know, Charles Spurgeon had said, a, a true prayer is an inventory of needs, a catalog of necessities, an exposure of secret wounds, a revelation of hidden poverty, and neglect, is a, a neglect of private prayer is the locust which devours the strength of the church. That's important for us to think about it that way, that when, when individual Christians choose to not live their life in prayer for, with the Lord, then that is the locust that devours the strength of the church. It's like, well, we pray at church. 
But do you pray individually? Do you have a specific time, a specific place that you go, a dedicated time where you say, I spend my time in prayer? That is the strength of the church. It's not the, oh, well, we came together and we prayed before we, we had the service and before the message was, was begun. No, it, the, the strength of the church is found in the individuals in the church with the strength of their private prayer life. So it was a dedicated time, not just that, but it was for a, also a specific purpose. You know, it is okay to write down on a prayer list and have specific purposes that you go before the Lord and pray. It's, it, it's always interesting when I meet people and they, I hear them pray, and they don't re- they're always really vague about the things that they're praying about. And when I say vague, it's like, oh, God, help us to stay healthy, help us to help keep us safe, do these, work, just let your will be done in our life. And there was never really any specific prayer. So the hard part of not praying specifics when we pray is, how do we know when God answered our prayer request? How do we know that he was actually there working in the midst? Well, we know he is. We know he's an awesome God and he will answer our prayer request. But we see that he went to pray for a specific purpose. Jesus spent the entire night in prayer to the Father. In addition to wanting to commune with his Father, we can surmise that Jesus also just wanted to share his burden of this ministry that he has and ask for wisdom in this ministry. And before he calls out these 12 apostles, they were already followers and now he's about to call them to be apostles. There are specific things that we should pray about like the burden of life and the burden of ministry. You know, every one of us, whether you are, uh, no matter what your occupation is, when we came to Christ, we are now enlisted into a life of ministry for him. And there is a burden that comes in our life when we choose to live a life for him. So the specific purpose, he was praying for his burdens. Luke chapter 22, verse 41 through 44, it says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down praying, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, and strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. See, we see he's praying for the burdens of that he's experiencing, and so we also should pray for our burden. Jesus knew very well the suffering that he was going to face at the cross. That's why he was going before the Lord to pray for those things. And every moment of his ministry brought him one step closer to the cross, and he understood that. He, he knew where it was going, which is why he was praying for this. So he was praying for the burden that he was bearing. Also, not only that, but he was praying for wisdom. So why would Jesus need wisdom? Well, Jesus needed the Father's wisdom for decisions in his ministry, namely the selection of these 12 apostles in which he was about to give. James 1, chapter 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Now, I'm thankful that where I lack wisdom, I can just go before the Lord and he can give me wisdom. You know, I wish everybody likes to think they know everything. You know how many people I talk to that it's like they have the answer for all the problems in this world except their own problems. You know, that's typically how we live our life. But why? Because we're not, su- we're not spending time in supplication with the Lord, asking him to help us with our burdens, asking him to give us the wisdom in our life. So we see that the, in the very first part of choosing, making this, this, this very difficult decision that was going to change the course of history, he said, like, I'm going to go spend time in prayer with the Lord. Not only that, but let's look at verse 13. And we see the number two, the selection of the apostles. It says, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. So we see the selection of the apostles now. So after spending an entire night of prayer and seeking, seeking the Father's wisdom, Jesus was now prepared to choose these men who were going to be his apostles, who was going to take the gospel out. So we see in the calling of the, 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 the disciples is what he called them here. The word disciple means meaning a learner, a pupil, someone who is, who is following him. So many of, many of the people who followed Jesus throughout the Galilean region were not really believers. Now that's important to understand. There were a lot of people who followed Jesus just because, oh, well, he's healing. He's providing food. He's, he's feeding thousands of people. He's performing miracles. You know, perhaps they were enamored with the miracles Jesus performed. 
or out of the great crowd, the, some who were believers and some who were not, Jesus would call the 12 apostles. Now, it's important that just because somebody goes to church does not make them a Christian. You know, we, just because somebody goes to church and attends service doesn't make them a believer in Christ. You know, it should be very easy for others to see the marks of true Christ, what, it, what it means to be a true Christian in the lives of believers. When somebody looks at you, they should be able to say, yes, they're a believer. Why? Because there's some marks in our life that, that, that just scream that we follow Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people, they don't live their life to where people can see Christ in them. Jesus was picking 12 people, not because just they were just mere, mere followers. There was a lot of people who were following Christ at this time who were not believers. So look, he, he chose these people because he can see that they were true believers in what was being said. Yeah, I, the, there's a story, a rather pompous-looking deacon was endeavoring to impress a, a class of uh, teenage boys about the importance of living the Christian life. And he stood before them, and he says, why do you, why do you think people call me a Christian? And after a moment's pause, they were thinking about it for a while. One of the youngest ones, about 13 years old, says, well, maybe it's because they don't know you yet. And you know, it's sad that many, many churches are filled with individual people like that who we say we're Christian, but if they looked at our life, they'd say, like, uh, are they? You might go to church, but are you, are, are, is there a difference? Would Jesus be able to look at us and say that, hey, there's something different. There's something different in all these other followers in these 12. So he called these disciples. And then we, we see he's the choosing of the apostles. So from these disciples... He chose 12 men to be apostles. Now, an apostle is different. We don't have people who claim uh, an apostle is one who had seen the resurrected Christ or is commissioned by Jesus Christ. Anyone who claims to be an apostle today is wrong. They're a heretic. It's, it's, that, that is false. There is no modern day apostles today. Jesus is not appearing in person, in flesh, in front of you, giving you a new message to go and deliver. He's not doing that. So anyone who claims to be an apostle today is wrong. So if somebody says that they're an apostle, just instantly go ahead and that negates everything else they're going to say after that. Um, but we see in this choosing of the apostle, there were some characteristics that we see that's important for us to understand why they were chosen. Well, first of all, what's the first thing that you see? Well, first of all, they were all men. They were, that, that, this is an important aspect, especially in today's society where we have a lot of uh, women who are pastors and deacons. We see from Scripture, these were all men. Now, th now this is a hard, difficult part because women were very vital in the helping of Jesus' ministry. Just as they are important and intricate into the church ministry of today. That is, there's a lot of things in this church that would not get done if we didn't have women serving in ministry. But we see that just as, as they were vital in Jesus' ministry, they're still as intricate in, in today's church ministry as well. But however, Jesus chose men to lead in that ministry. Jesus chose men. And scripture tells us pastors and deacons are meant to be men. They're not meant to be women. So well, how, where, do you, where do you get that from? Well, 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, it says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Then it says a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. So first of all, the first requirement of being, one of the requirements of being a pastor is it has to be a man. Women are not called to serve in that ministry. Any church that has a woman being the pastor is not doctrinally sound, and that is just the first step of opening up to see what other false doctrines can be taught in that church. So not only were there all men in the pastor being men, but also we know that that's true with deacons as well. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. Now this is an important aspect in which the very first one before we hopped into all these other parts that we wanted to address. Because there are a lot of believers today that think that, that men and women are 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 created the exact same. Now, men and women are equal in how they were created, but God has called and created people for two completely different purposes, and praise the Lord for that. Because there's a lot of things that I lack that my wife makes up for. But my wife is not the co-pastor at Mountain View Baptist Church. 
There is a lot of things that my strengths are different than my wife's strengths. And her strengths are different than my strengths. And to say that men and women are equal in every instance is not biblically or biologically correct. I'm thankful her strengths are better or different than mine, and I have different strengths than she has as well. It's important to see, yes, here, women are important in Jesus' ministry, as we'll see throughout, as we continue throughout the Gospel of Luke, and just as women are intricate for today. But the apostles and pastors and deacons, they were called, they, these were men. And that's what God had chose. So, but the rest of these things that apply to all of us is why he chose them. Well, first of all, these were men, but also these individuals were already active. So, well, Pastor, what do you mean they're already active? Well, the apostles were chosen among Jesus' disciples, revealing these were already, they were already active in Jesus' ministry. Why do we think God's going to call us to greater things in our life when we aren't willing to serve the Lord now in the little things? These apostles were busy. They weren't lazy. They weren't waiting. Um, I remember there was a, when we first came to Mountain View, there was some, an individual who had come in and says, hey, pastor, if you need anything, I'll, just let me know. I'll help you. I'll be a blessing. Great. I need help with this and this and this and this and this. I, I need a lot of help because there's like no, there wasn't a whole lot of people here. Like, well, I mean, if you want somebody to preach. No, I think we have that covered. It's kind of why I'm here right now, but I do need help with all these other instances. You know, the bathroom needs remodeling. The roof's going to need repairing. Everything needs to get cleaned up. We got cobwebs in places. We need to get it cleaned up. It's like, well, I'm not going to do that, but I'll sit and wait. And if you ever need me to speak, I'll speak. But why do we think that God's going to call us to greater things when we aren't faithful in the things that are already available for us to serve? And it's observable that God often calls men to places of dignity and honor when they were busy and honest in their vocation and their employment and just serving the Lord. God has never called a lazy person to do anything for him. Now, we live a life where everybody just chooses, like, well, you know, I'm just going to sit here, I'm going to do what I want, and then one day, I'm going to have everything I ever desired. You know, Scripture says that if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Why would God, if, if you're not, if scripturally speaking, we don't eat if we don't work, why do we think God's going to call us to great things if we aren't willing to do anything for him now? And many times all throughout Scripture, the people we see who did great things for God were the ones who were serving when no one else noticed. Like Saul was seeking his father's donkeys. David was, his, uh, was taking care of his father's sheep when he was called to the kingdom. The shepherds were feeding their flocks when they found that, saw that glorious revelation from the angels, God called four apostles from fishing and Matthew from collecting taxes. Moses was keeping Jethro's sheep. Gideon was from the threshing floor. Elisha was from the plows. God never calls a lazy man or woman. He'll never call a lazy man. God never encourages idleness. And he will not despise people of the lowest employment or the lowest background or to the lowliest deed. He just desires someone to serve him. And so often we say, well, I'm not going to do anything until I think I have what I desire. Why is it that we want what, what I desire, not what he desires? Because our Christian life isn't about you and I, it's about Jesus Christ. These people are already active. These people are serving the Lord. It's always interesting that the people that end up becoming leaders are always the ones who are busy serving the Lord. So they were already active. Not only were they already active, but they were commissioned by Jesus. As I said, one of the requirements for an apostle was Jesus Christ had to commission them personally. So the definition of apostle is meaning to order one to go to a place appointed. A disciple is a learner an apprentice, while an apostle is a chosen messenger sent with a special commission. There was a big difference. Now, we may not be apostles today, but he has commissioned us to serve him and to spread the gospel. Jesus had many disciples, but only 12 hand-picked apostles. Now, these men were specifically chosen by Jesus Christ. And the, th the truth is, is that even though they were hand-picked by Jesus Christ, Today, every believer today has the privilege of being commissioned by Jesus to be ambassadors in this world. You have been commissioned by Jesus Christ. How, how do you know I've been commissioned by Jesus Christ? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. It says, now, then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you 
in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Now, an ambassador is a representative, much as when a king needed, or a king or a president needed somebody to go on their behalf and speak on their behalf to a, to a foreign country or a foreign land, he would send an ambassador. It's like, I speak for the king. I speak for the president. I speak for the person who sent me. And we as believers have been commissioned by Jesus as ambassadors for him to go and stand in a lost world and tell those of Jesus Christ that they were commissioned by Jesus. Not only were they commissioned by Jesus, but they also witnessed, they were a witness of the resurrection of Christ. So each of these men, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, were eyewitnesses of, of Christ's resurrection. You know, even in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1, the apostle Paul, he became an apostle. Why? Jesus came, Christ came to him, and he saw the resurrected Christ. He said, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are, ye, are, are not ye my work in the Lord? This was one of the requirements to be an apostle. You have seen the resurrected Christ. So this was some of the requirements. But then the important part of understanding the requirements, some of, those require, some of those apply to us today, others do not, but the main emphasis that we see here is the service of the apostles. The service of the apostles. Luke chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Simon, who also, he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphas, the, and Simon the Zealots, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which was also a tr the, the traitor. So there was a, the service of the apostles. What were they doing? Well, in this, the apostles were sent to conquer the known world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it's important, I use that word conquer, because we're called to go out and declare God's word. To go and conquer the world with the word of God and tell people of Jesus Christ. Now we see Simon. Simon was, a, was renamed Peter. He was the first apostle called by Jesus. Then you see Andrew. Andrew was concerned for others. That's seen in the way that he brought his, brought his brother Peter to Jesus. James, the son of Zebedee, was the brother of John. John, he was a gentle and passionate man, but he, he, he was beloved by Jesus. Philip found Nathaniel and brought him to Jesus. Thomas also called, um, doubt, uh, was also called Doubting Thomas, but he still served the Lord. Bartholomew was also called Nathaniel, and he was miraculously had seen, been, been seen by Jesus under that fig tree before Philip brought him to the Lord. We see Matthew or Levi, he was that publican, the tax collector before he followed Christ. James, we see that he followed him as well, and uh, 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 Simon the Zealot, the, the, the Zealots were opposed to the Roman government, and they wanted to go and declare what it, the, the, the Messiah was coming in the face of a tyrannical government. Judas, uh, the brother of James, Judas was practical and thorough in everything that he did. And then Judas Iscariot, it was just a miracle that, that by God's grace that Judas Iscariot would, uh, even though betray Jesus to his death, that he even had a part in Christ's ministry. But every one of these individuals played a different role in what Jesus had for them. John chapter 6, verse 64, it says, But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. You know, it's interesting when you look at the service of the, the apostles, Jesus already knew what each one was going to be capable of doing for him. And there are many times just by the grace of God that he's chose to call us even though we reject him and even though we choose to not follow him on a daily basis. He said, no, I'm still calling you. I, I still want you to be my ambassador. Now of the seven apostles, uh, seven of the apostles were fishermen. One was a tax collector. The truth is, is these were just common men that God used in great ways. Sometimes we look at the, the, the 12 apostles and say, I, I could never do that. I could never stand for truth the way they stood for truth. 
No, these were just ordinary people that God used in an extraordinary way. God wants to do the same thing for every single individual in here as well. He wants to do something great with every believer in here today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And, great, and, and, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And based, and based things of the world and things which are despised God, hath God chosen. Yea, and all which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's important for us to realize that as believers, so many of us, we say, well, I can't do that. My background's not good. I, I got saved later in life, or I don't know enough scripture. I, I, I don't have the ability to do this. I don't have the pedigree. Whatever it is, you say, I don't have the ability to serve the Lord. No, God wants to use us because the flesh should not glory in what he's done. Our flesh, we can't glory in our flesh in the presence of Christ. There's nothing for us to glory in. God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment or, or the abandonment or, of reliance on them. It's either he's going to use us or we're going to abandon all of our own personal resources or he's just going to use someone who has no resources. Why? Because he, he doesn't want us to get the glory. God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment of reliance on them. And all through history, God has chosen and used people who are nobodies, people who just turned to the Lord because their unusual dependence on him made it possible that this unique display of God's power and grace to the world, he wants to make sure that he's getting the glory for that. He wants to use every single one of us. Don't ever think that, oh, God can't use me. I don't know enough. I haven't learned enough. I haven't been a Christian long enough. I haven't studied enough. No, God wants to confound the wise. He wants to use people with a total dependence on him for his unique display of power and grace. He chose and used nobodies. And then he chose and used somebodies only when they renounced their dependence on their own natural ab abilities. He's not gonna use somebody who is a somebody until they renounce, hey, I know, I'm just doing this in God's power. Only when they renounce their own dependence of their natural abilities and their own resources. God uses common people to accomplish great things in service for him. He wants us to do great things for him. Don't ever think that, oh, I, I can't do that. I can't get up and speak in front of people. I can't sing. I can't do that. I can't serve people. I can't go and hand out an invitation. I can't lead someone to Christ. Why? God wants to use you for that exact purpose. And so many of us are peddling in church, peddling around, waiting to say, well, maybe one day I'll be great enough to serve him. No, God wants to use us now, and we're just choosing to not follow him because we're in reliance of our own personal strength. That's important. I think several well-known men all throughout the Bible that God used greatly in, short of their, in spite of their shortfalls. And that's important for us to realize no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter what kind of person we were before Christ, or even how hard we have fallen after coming to Christ, God wants to use you. And we see it all throughout Scripture. You know, Noah got drunk after surviving the flood, after he was the one chosen. Abraham lied to Pharaoh about Sarah being his sister. Moses was forbidden from entering the promised land after disobeying God's command. Aaron led the people in creating and worshiping a golden calf. David committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered in an attempt to cover up his own sin. Elijah fled from Jezebel in fear after a great spiritual victory on Mount Carmel. Isaiah was humbled by his sin when he stood before God's throne in a vision. Jonah disobeyed God's command to preach to Nineveh because he became an outright racist against the people not wanting them to hear God's truth. The truth is, is that God wants to use us in spite of our difficulties. And so many times we sit back in our Christian life and say, well, maybe one day I'll be great enough. No, God wants to use us in spite of our shortfalls, in, in, in spite of our difficulties. So then what's, what's interesting about these disciples and what we see all throughout Scripture is not only were these apostles flawed men, but these people were people who were courageous. 
Say, look, I'm going to stand for truth, and I'm going to stand for what's right, regardless of what that's going to bring in my life. Many of us will say, God, I want you to use me, unless it gets difficult. Now, if it's hard, I don't want to do it. Now, if it's easy, I'll do it. You know, there's, I, in this, I, 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 I think of the suffering and martyrdom that most of the, these um, that, that, that these apostles had experienced and almost what we see all throughout the uh, Christian history, all throughout history, we see people who have died and suffered a, the, the death as a martyr because they were willing to stand for truth. Almost every one of the apostles suffered death as a martyr. Simon Peter was crucified upside down in Rome uh, by Nero in 68 or 69 AD. Andrew was crucified at about 70 AD. James, the brother of John, was put to death by Herod Agrippa, uh, beheaded in in 45 AD, John the Beloved, the Romans tried to boil him in, or, in oil, but he was spared miraculously, and they banished him to the island of Patmos, where he was later returned to Ephesus, and then he died peacefully in 10, 101 AD. He was the only one. Philip, Philip, his head was bound to a pillar as, it was, as he was stoned to death in Pergia in 54 AD. Bartholomew first greatly tortured, and then he was filleted alive because of what he did in standing for the Lord. And then after that, after being uh, filleted alive, finally beheaded by the king in Armenia in 70 AD. Matthew or Levi was crucified and stoned and decapitated by the Jews in 70 AD. Thomas was tortured with red hot plates cast into the furnace, and his side was pierced by spears in 70 AD. James the James here was cast down out from the temple and stoned and beaten to death with a club in 63 AD. Simon the Zealot was crucified by the governor of Syria in 70 AD. And, Ju and Judas, the son of James, was beaten to death by pagan priest in Persia. I, I look at the martyrdom that these, that these apostles had experienced and then all throughout history, people standing for what was right. You see, these were people who were common men. They, they didn't have the pedigree. They didn't have any. They were, these were just calm people. They weren't lazy. They were going out. They were working hard. They were saying, I'm going to do this. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm a fisherman. I'm a tax collector. I'm busy. I'm doing these things. And then when they chose to follow Christ, Jesus saw something different in them to all the other apostles, to all the other followers, I mean. And that was they weren't lazy. There was a genuine repentance in their heart, a genuine belief of what they did. And not only do you see that these were common people with a lot of sin in their life, but these were also individuals who were suffering for Christ. Why? They understood the importance of the gospel. They understood the importance of getting the word of, of the Lord out. To be an ambassador for him. I think it's important for us so many times. I, I meet people that say, oh, well, you know, the, the disciples, the, the 12 apostles probably lied about Jesus' resurrection. I'm like, yeah, because everybody just hopes for death. Everybody just hopes that they can be executed and tortured. It's like uh, all, all, the 12, all the 12 apostles sat together. It's like, let's tell everybody Jesus rose from the dead. Or what are we going to get? From, are we going to get famous? No, actually, people are going to hate you. Or are we going to get riches? No, actually, you're probably going to lose your jobs. Are people going to follow us? No, you're actually going to be beheaded in the next 30 years. Oh man, that sounds like a great lie. Let's, let's make it up for everybody to believe. No, but these people suffered martyrdom because they understood what it meant to follow Christ. Now, I'm not saying that anybody in here is going to suffer martyrdom because we are believers, but I will say that that doesn't always mean that the Christian life is always easy. And there are going to be times where you stand for what's right as an ambassador for Jesus Christ and we have to make the decision, am I going to represent Christ or am I going to represent myself and just say I represent Christ? There's a lot of believers like that. There's a lot of believers who will go out into the world and say, oh, I'm a Christian, but you represent yourself. You're not representative of Christ. These men being a disciple, to these men being a disciple meant they were willing to live and die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of us, we have a hard time of just saying, oh, I, I, don't, I have a hard time just saying I want to live for Christ. We're not even asking people to die for Christ. These men, be, to be a disciple meant that they were willing to live their life and die for Jesus Christ. And the lives of the apostles were, and, and especially their devotion to the Lord in the face of death, should challenge us as believers uh, to live for Christ more passionately and willing to stand up for him regardless of the consequences. 
See, these apostles said, I'm willing to live and die for Christ. Most of us, our calling is just to live for Christ. And we so, we so seldom can live our life and say, oh yeah, I, I live for Christ today. Jesus knew the apostles were sinners. He chose them anyway, praise the Lord. You don't have to wait till he's like, oh, well, I got to clean up my life. I got to make sure that everything in my life's looking good. And then I'll come to Christ. And then I'll serve him. That's not what he's asking. He knew these apostles were, were sinners. He was willing to use them regardless of, uh, of, of the sin in their life. He, he said, you, I'm choosing you to serve me anyways. God's choosing you to serve him today. Jesus knew these apostles were sinners. He's like, like I'm choosing you to follow me. And even though they were great sinners, Jesus chose these believers to be ambassadors. And even with us in here, as great sinners as we are today, he said, look, I want you to be my ambassador to the world and carry my message of the gospel to all nations. I want you, you don't even have to, you, there's, there's no martyrdom here in, in America. You just, you just have to live for me. And we so seldom have a difficult time of saying, look, I, I, I'll live for Christ. But how, how often is it as, as believers say, look, I'm, I'm willing to live and die for Christ. We, it's easy to say with our mouth. It's very different when it faces an opposition to the world. The call of the apostles were like, look, these are sinners. These are imperfect people. People with nothing to offer. But I see that they're hungry to do what's right and they want to serve the Lord. They're going to serve me. They're busy. They're not lazy. They're going to go out and I'm going to use them even in their sin. Why? Because they understood what it meant to be a disciple. And that was to live and die for Jesus Christ. Where do we fall in that? Let's pray.